Hi, this is Priyanka Chopra, and you are watching Channel Y. The biggest South Asian media group, Y Media. Y Media. Y Media, y media Group, established in 2001, is a media company with a 360-degree approach in reaching our audience over five platforms: television, radio, newspaper, online news portal, and mobile app. Y Media has newspaper, midweek, radio, South Asian pop. Hi, I'm Amitabh Bachchan and you're listening to South Asian pop. Hi, this is Amir Khan and you're listening to South Asian pop. All English, 24-7 television network and Y Media Plus. You are watching Channel Y. Channel Y. Prime Minister, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be back. Y Media is the official media partner for TIFF 2022. It's so exciting to be here. Exclusive show all about the Toronto International Auto Show. So Cam's going to tell us more about uh, the amazing vehicle behind us right now. You can see the Devel 16. Hi, I'm Ria Khan, and on behalf of Y Media, welcome to Channel Y. One Y Media Group welcomes you to Channel Y once again. Channel Y ke entertainment special sure. made jahan pe. SouthAsianDaily.com, the biggest South Asian media group. Why media? Hello, everyone. My name is Yudhir Jaswal. I'm the group editor at Why Media, and today we have a very special guest here at our Channel Y Studios. I'd like to welcome Member of Parliament from Brampton North, Ruby Sota. Ruby ji, very warm welcome. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you, Jyotir? I'm doing great. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. It has been a while since you came here. It's been a while since I've been in studio. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Thank you so much. Why don't we start with the, the most important topic, that's inflation. Uh, we see the living cost is continuously going higher. So what's your government doing about that? Yeah, we, we've been working hard to try to make sure that uh, Canadians have supports during this time. Uh, I know that uh, the Bank of Canada is trying uh, its best to try to bring inflation costs down, but in the process, Canadians are feeling the pain. And uh, in order to support Canadians, we've brought many different initiatives. I'm not saying that all of those initiatives apply to every single Canadian. Of course, every Canadian, you know, that maybe isn't receiving childcare feels, well, childcare isn't helping me. But childcare is helping lots of people in my community, right? Uh, childcare is helping save, uh, you know, I have had constituents come up to me and anywhere from seven to 10 to $14,000 a year. Um, we've brought grocery companies, that's the first government ever to bring in CEOs uh, to Ottawa to s instruct them that they need to come up with a plan. Um, we're working continuously with them to try to make sure that the price of, uh, you know, a basket of goods at a grocery store can come down, especially the basic necessities. Uh, so that's a work in progress. I know our government announced um, that we will have um, progress made on that very soon. So it is the first time that CEOs are now committing and may taking steps. And so hopefully we can we can show you results in that in the coming days. Um, you know, we have tried to work with different uh, workers across the country. You know, a lot of parties have been talking about the working class. Well, as uh, the governing Liberal Party, we're the first um, 
first government for decades to do anything about helping unions with their rights so that employees can stay at good paying jobs. So there's lots, lots of initiatives we're doing to help create an environment where people feel safe and secure. Um, however, we are dealing with a global crisis uh, when it comes to inflation and cost of goods going up. So I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, Canada is going to be immune to all of the global factors that are happening. But I think relatively speaking, we're in a good spot. Um, our inflation numbers have been coming down. And, and I think as we see them come down, we're seeing the governor of Bank of Canada uh, make announcements where the interest rates aren't going up anymore. And that's going to provide uh, relief. So as long as we Canadians, as Canadians, we can keep heading in the right direction. That'll be important. The full economic statement is coming up. So that'll be something exciting for Canadians to, to watch out for. I, we are going to do our best, just like we did in the last budget, to be responsible in the measures that we take so that uh, there are no more inflationary pressures from our side. Yeah, the Bank of Canada's governor, you know, last time I, uh, I was listening to him, as much as I agree with you, I think so. Uh, they going to they could cut down the rate sooner than later, maybe April or mid-2024, but they haven't committed on that one. No, and I, I as a member of parliament, would never like to um, take guesses on what the Bank of Canada is going to do because a lot of Canadians sometimes think that, you know, we as a government work together with the Bank of Canada uh, when coming up with these interest increases and stuff like that. That is not true. The Bank of Canada is completely independent. And so uh, if I was to sit here and, and give my guesses as to when things are going to happen, uh, I think that could have, you know, a negative impact. And I don't want to confuse Canadians. I think they should continue uh, watching what the Bank of Governors says. Um, and, and we're heading in a good direction. I think we're heading in a much better direction than we could have been. Um, we have seen a little bit of a decrease in job num jobs numbers, but that too, I think, will be good for, our, um, for the outcome of what the Bank of, C Governor, of Canada's governor announces. Um, but we're, we're, we're not seeing the recession that people feared either, right? So I do think that in some part, um, the reason why we're being able to withhold a deep recession at this point is because we made the right investments uh, at the right time. We still do see growth in uh, a lot of sectors. Uh, we've done a lot of investments when it comes to uh, green energy, our battery plants in Ontario, um, and a lot of other areas. Uh, recently, you heard a big announcement, uh, which uh, has been controversial, controversial. However, I think it's important to explain to Canadians why we're trying to provide relief in the area uh, of carbon pricing to Canadians uh, that heat their homes with oil pumps. I think that's a really uh, important measure that we've taken. I think it's been a little misunderstood. Uh, it's been understood that only Atlantic Canadians are going to be getting this type of benefit. Uh, I'd like to correct that narrative. It isn't only Atlantic Canadian, and it's also not all Atlantic Canadians. Uh, Atlantic Canadians also use uh, gas for the most part. The majority of Atlantic Canadians use that. But they have about a 30% uh, population that is on heating oil, uh, not by choice. You know, some people will say, well, you know, why this is a decision that they've made. There's older homes and we have them in Ontario. We have about 265,000 um, Canadians, uh, Ontarians, sorry, that are on heating oil. And we'd like to give them that benefit as well so that they can have a freeze on their um, on the carbon pricing when it comes to their bill. So we're working with the provinces to get um an agreement with them to join our new program, uh, which will provide free, uh, you know, oil, sorry, free uh, heating pumps to households uh, so they can convert from oil in that three year period. We want to see mostly all Canadians, if we can, convert from heating oil to electric pumps because we think that that is a much more efficient uh, and greener way to heat your home. So that's another initiative that we're taking to help Canadians that are worst off. I know it doesn't help, once again, all Canadians, but we're trying to put in measures that help those that need it the most because their costs did go up by four to five times higher than everyone else's. Right. That's a good mayor. Um, what are you just mentioning about uh, recession? I know technically we need to have two quarters of negative growth, mm -hmm. uh, but then the last five months before when I was checking, I mean, it, growth has stalled, it's almost flattened, actually it's going negative. Uh, so it's been almost uh, in, a, in a 
recession and the next year uh, the forecast says 0.9% uh, less than 1% of growth yeah. so it's not things are not too good the last five six months well, I mean, even the next year this yeah. has been forecasted ever since the pandemic for a long time uh, i think sometimes we need to rewind and and realize where we have come from right. um, when the pandemic hit it was the largest crisis that we had ever seen in a hundred year period um, whether we were going to be able to get through that period was even hard to imagine at that time. Uh, our government stepped forward with lots of supports for Canadians. I don't think any government around the world uh, helped and provided for their citizens in the time of need the way we did. And yet still, um, after that recession, uh, I mean, after that pandemic, a deep recession was also, you know, being predicted by many economists. We've been able to, you know, slow that down and with, uh, withstand that as well. So I think it's important to put things into perspective. Uh, many countries around the world have a much higher interest rate than us. Even next door in the U.S., uh, they are seeing higher interest rates than us by, you know, by half a percent, but but still higher than Canada. And I think it's important. The U.K. is higher, and I could name almost every other European country as well that is much higher. So I think, relatively speaking, um, where we were and where, where we came, what we came through and where we are today, um, I think, you know, I think we are in as good of a place as we can be. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll definitely give credit where it's due without blurring the lines. I agree as much that has also been a debate whether the support that the Canadian government provided, whether that contributed to any inflation or was that good or not. But I think that was the right step in the right direction. Yeah. Had the support There is a debate, but there's inflation in every other country. Yes. And yes. they didn't support their <laughs> citizens as, as well. Okay. So we can have that debate, but I think, you know, we, we should compare uh, to see what other countries did and what, what their inflation numbers are at. R right, okay. yeah. No, the support, I think, it was w much needed, and I think the government did the right step in that one. Uh, Quickly moving on to the Canada-India file, I know there has been an issue right now. Uh, don't you think the Prime Minister, uh, Titi Chamtakan, going to the Parliament, uh, I mean, obviously, if the Globe and Mail did their story uh, uh, regarding her deep uh, major assassination, um, then the Prime Minister could have simply said, the law is going to take its own course. We are fully aware of what you're talking. They don't, Robert Five or Globe and Mail didn't have anything to support. They just had this information they didn't, they didn't see, and I'm sure uh, you haven't seen anything. Jagmeet Singh might have seen something. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. Have mm -hmm. you seen uh, anything? Or, or do you think the Prime Minister jumped the gun? He could have just said the next day that, yes, we, we know, let the law take its own course. What do you think? Well, I think it's important to take leadership on issues that uh, could cause a lot of conflict and confuse Canadians when they were, if they were to come out in a very, um, in a way that would have been unpredictable for the government as to what stories would have come out. The Prime Minister was aware of this issue. Uh, our security agencies were aware of the issue of the link between the Indian government and the assassination Is of Pradeep Is it an alleged link or, or they showed there is a link? Well, they have credible, credible intelligence, and uh, for now, I guess we're calling it an alleged link. Uh, but they have credible, uh, they have credible security agency intelligence that that creates a link. That creates a link between the Indian government but and the assassination. They, then by the foreign affairs, Mr. Melanie Jolly, the very next day, she's saying, if true. And uh, I've very closely watched Prime Minister Trudeau even up at Mill yesterday watching every single statement yeah. that he's made. So he's never mentioned the word proof. He's only saying allegations or credible allegations. Yeah. So he's not, Prime Minister is not saying the word proof. Yeah, you're the only MP that's mentioned is Sukh Taliwal. He says we could have proof. So yeah. I want to just clarify once again. Do you, sure. say, do you say we have proof of that or it's merely an allegation or an alleged link? It's intelligence information, and intelligence information comes in various different varieties. Uh, in order for intelligence to become evidence uh, or become proof, I would say evidence and proof is, uh, uh, you know, synonyms for each other. And in this case, we could uh, call it that. Uh, we need the investigation. Uh, to have some more support, to be certain interviews to take place, I believe, um, and and 
time will show that. So at this point, it is evidence when it will be, pres I mean, sorry, it's intelligence, but at, at the point that it gets presented in court, it would be evidence, right? Uh, so we can only call it evidence, uh, intelligence this is why it's so easy to mess up uh, on yeah. these issues, right? We can only call it intelligence uh, until that uh, it comes forward in, in, in a courtroom, right? Um, and until the charges are laid. Uh, so that is why the Prime Minister and Minister Jolie are being very careful uh, with the language they're using. Uh, we don't want to obviously influence also um, the outcomes that would happen in a courtroom down the road. But we do at the same time want India to take um, these allegations very seriously. Uh, this intelligence is not rumors. It's not Jody Thomas, our national uh, security agency head, did not just go to India based off of, you know, a rumor she heard on, on the street. Uh, it is uh, like has been said that uh, this intelligence is very credible and therefore that was brought there on on a few occasions uh, the response is not something that uh, uh, that was of cooperation we're still hoping uh, that things can improve and that we can find that cooperation um, we're not looking to find a fight with or pick a fight with India what we're looking to do is first and foremost, is to make sure that Canadian citizens are secure in their country and that they're protected. Uh, second, we're trying to, to make sure uh, that our sovereignty is also um, protected. And third, we want to make sure that the truth is revealed uh, at the end of the day. In order to get to the evidence point and to get to truth, some cooperation would um, be beneficial, I think, for both sides. And, and that's what we're looking for. And I think coming back to timing, um, timing sometimes, and, and there are obviously lessons that have been learned from some of the, the stories of Chinese interference. Uh, those were some events that the Prime Minister was not briefed about. Uh, this is something that the Prime Minister was briefed about that rose to the level where the National Security Advisor obviously brought this to his attention and therefore having had knowledge um, and knowing what type of story could come out, uh, I think it takes leadership and courage to say, I will get ahead of this story and explain to Canadians uh, as best as I can without, um, without you know, crossing the line uh, of revealing what he's not allowed to reveal, uh, according to you know, the security clearance that he has. But he's uh, made it clear enough, I think, so that Canadians can understand uh, where we stand on this issue and what Canada's concern is when it comes to this. Uh, so it's hard at this point now to just put a, you know, put a blanket over it all and to forget about it because we have someone whose life was lost. And I think it's important to, to remember that because sometimes we get caught up in you know, what is happening with uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, events and diplomatic relations with India. But I think it is really important to continue to remember where this started. Um, it started because there was a murder here in Canada that took place in June. Um, the investigations of that murder and the intelligence gathering that took place has led us to this spot. Um, we were behind closed doors trying to cooperate uh, on many occasions with the Indian government. Even the Prime Minister had brought up the issue to the Prime Minister of India. Um, so, But that didn't really get us anywhere, right? So we're hoping still um, that, uh, that we can continue to cooperate and work together. There's been obviously issues. We're not happy about uh, the visa cancellations, but I am happy to see there's some, you know, um, some light there that some categories have been opened up. Uh, we're definitely not happy about the 41 diplomats uh, whose immunity was stripped away. Uh, that is not a diplomatic norm to just unilaterally make that type of a decision. And nor do I think India, you know, was in the right for making that type of decision because uh, the allegations are that Indian agents have done something incorrect in Canada. There was no allegations that our diplomats had done anything um, incorrect in India. And so therefore, I don't know why that type of, uh, you know, measure was taken. Right. Um, I totally agree. Very unfortunate what has happened. And I fully agree with what you were saying just mentioned uh, your first point that yes, uh, it's, uh, you know, the Canadian's life, they have to be protected. Any Canadian citizen um, shot on Canadian soil, and if at all, it's by a foreign agent. It's a very serious thing. 
it is a very serious thing, very unfortunate. Uh, moving on to your next uh, point, the sovereignty, absolutely we stand for United Canada. Uh, and I'm glad our Prime Minister Trudeau said it in Mumbai, I still remember his India tour, the, the previous one, not this G21. And he said it in Mumbai, he said it in other places as well, we stand for United India. But their concern is there are people sitting here who are trying to break up India. They're saying, what about our sovereignty? Mm -hmm. uh, I stand with the Prime Minister's statement still today. Uh, we, we stand for a United India. Uh, we take seriously also any credible allegations that are brought forward. Uh, and from time to time, uh, there have been very non-credible allegations that are often brought forward. Uh, so in Canada, there, you know, in order for an investigation to take place, and we would, we would investigate anyone doing anything illegal here on Canadian soil. We've also signed agreements with India uh, to be able to share intelligence that we think could be of concern or of you know, necessity for India to have. Uh, we want to continue a good relationship in that way and, and no ways yeah. are we trying to promote um, any violence in India or any violence anywhere else in the world. But the concern is when twice Red Corner Notice was issued for Hardeep Nijir, the Canadians never cooperated with us. And I do remember Prime Minister Trudeau was here, sitting right here and we discussed uh, when Prime Minister Trudeau went to India. Uh, that time, the former Chief Minister of Punjab, Captain Amrinder Singh, he handed him a list of 10 people yeah. Uh, uh, and I knew that information from there and here when I asked our Prime Minister, he agreed, yes, the list was there. I believe so, Hadeem Nijis' name was there as well. So they, they issued red corner notices, they issued the list, but that's their allegation that Canada yeah. is not cooperating. So we have to test it according to what our rules and uh, of evidence are, what, our thresh what things meet our threshold uh, in order to rise to that type of seriousness. Of course, we've cooperated on other measures. You can bring up, many people are on many lists. We don't just uh, take lightly and send our citizens abroad to another country uh, without being certain that the allegations against them are, are credible ones. Right. And uh, recently there have been threats, you know, uh, regarding Air India as, uh, as well. I know uh, we did get an information that, yes, uh, it's being investigated by the Public Safety Minister and our RCMP as well. But uh, I think it, it came a little bit late. It almost took uh, 24 to 48 hours by the time the response. Was but the threat came out. And for two, three days, people were thinking whether we should be booking Air India flights on 19th of November. Air India is a very sensitive issue because of the history that we have yeah. in 1985. So we, we started getting calls on air, on radio, TV, and we had no answers. We had to s send in emails and then we did get the, the response. Yeah. So, so we're thankful for, for, for that one. But uh, that's, that's the question. I mean, some, somebody can issue a threat to Air India, to aviation. How does this work? Yeah, so the person in question um, is an American citizen. And uh, the organization that he belongs to uh, is also a, an American registered organization. However, it's completely, uh, I would say, in, in my unprofessional, uh, uh, since I'm not in policing opinion, uh, rises to uh, beyond the level of hate and into a criminal uh, level of what uh, was said in that video that you're referencing. I immediately brought it to the attention of the public safety minister. You did. I immediately. You personally? Okay. I personally did. Okay, thank you. Uh, absolutely. I personally had a conversation right away with Minister LeBlanc about the issue okay. because um, I don't want to see that happen mm -hmm. here in Canada. Um, that is of no interest to Canadians, uh, to the Canadian government. And uh, immediately he had conversations with the RCMP. The RCMP has uh, already informed the minister that they are on it and investigating. I am not aware now uh, myself as to uh, where they're at on that. That's not something they come back and, and, and you know, it's not usually a two-way conversation. They don't come back and tell a member of parliament where the investigation is going, but that they have taken it very seriously. And whether they have to cooperate with the FBI uh, or American agencies, um, I'll be sure if I do get more information to share it with Channel Y, because I'm sure it's of um, interest to your viewers. But that that's where we're at right now. And um, and I don't know if you are aware of where this individual is or isn't, uh, but that's something that our agencies are working on. Yeah, I must put it on record, and we did it previously as well, that this individual has said it was not a threat. He was merely targeting an Indian business, not to get business. So maybe that's what he's, he's saying. He's claiming it's, it's, it wasn't a threat. But uh, That's not a way to target a business, I would say. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, you're right. So that was the question anyways. So quickly moving on to our next uh, thing. Crime has been a major issue. I spoke with uh, Mr. David Limity earlier as well and then Arif Rani as well. Where are we with on bail reforms now? Yeah, so we've passed legislation in the House of Commons. Uh, um, C48 is the piece of legislation that we recently passed. Uh, I sent out information to everyone who lives in my riding uh, as to what's in the piece of legislation. It talks about uh, making it harder for repeat offenders to be able to get bail. Uh, those that, you know, uh, commit a crime uh, uh, or use a handgun or any type of weapon in the commission of a crime. Um, those that have previous domestic violence um, charges. So a whole array of people would be caught by uh, C-48 and we're hoping that this provides further guidance and direction to the courts uh, so that bail isn't taken so what seems right now. <laughs> um, you know, you have to be in an individual courtroom and uh, understand the issues on both sides, but uh, being a lawyer previously, I do take that very seriously and I'm not trying to smear maybe our, our judicial system. I do think we have a good judicial system but to some degree there have been incidences that we have seen that have come to light where repeat offenders uh, that in my opinion uh, I don't think uh, should have been back out on the street were so uh, this happens in provincial courtrooms is what we're looking at um, judges are free to deny bail Right? There is a system where evidence is brought to them as to why the offender should be uh, is not a risk to the community at large. Uh, it's surprising me the number of bail that is granted. So that's why we felt as a government that it's important for us to put forward legislation to, to make it more clear as to what the parameters for bail should be. Yeah. In the interest of time, let me club the next two questions uh, together. Mm -hmm. uh, immigration numbers, as much as we're happy to support, we don't really one that okay this is 200,000 half a million million you could bring in 2 million people in a year that's okay with us and we need immigrants um, we definitely know that um, job numbers so many other things declining birth rate uh, but the question is uh, the infrastructure the infrastructure here uh, whether it's the congestion or it's the healthcare that is an issue how would you tackle that we're not building any new infrastructure here yeah, so we're having, um, we're having the Minister, Minister Miller has, uh, with the levels, announced that uh, he's going to continue to undertake conversations with the provinces to see where we're at. Uh, we have stepped forward uh, as a federal government. Uh, previous federal governments had completely removed themselves from the conversation of housing. We are back into the conversation of housing, making sure that we also support our municipalities and what they need. A lot of municipalities were talking about not having water and sewage and all of the things that now even in order to decrease some and speed up the process a bit, uh, Ontario is taking away funding to the municipalities that used to come from developers uh, to provide for that. So, you know, will housing get built if you don't have the infrastructure of sewer and water? Uh, so that's why we've made announcements like our recent one um, of over $114 million to the city of Brampton to, to help cities develop uh, in the areas that they need and that money has some flexibility to it so that they can use it in different ways uh, to be able to have uh, the foundation they need to attract um, developers to build in that area. Uh, so that's one measure that we're taking. Uh, in terms of uh, the levels that you're talking about, we just announced uh, that 485,000 um, new uh, and people that are already here will become PR in the next year. That's what levels are. It's how many people will become PR in one year. It's not how many new people are coming into Canada. It's how many people are becoming permanent residents. And so many of those people are already here. Um, many of our, uh, you know, uh, foreign workers, our international students uh, are already here, are already living somewhere. Uh, about 100,000 also, like, so that's about 60%, the economic class. Maybe I'm missing a point, just clear for mm -hmm. maybe I'm missing a point here. Because when we, two, two points. First of all, I think the population increased by almost a million. We just were reporting 39 million Canada's population, mm -hmm. it, and now the stats can say in the last 12 months, it has increased to 40 million. Yeah. So a million people just increased in Canada, number mm -hmm. one. Number two, uh, the PR thing, you could explain it better. But I think uh, even the international students or any visitor or anybody else, yeah. they would still be using the same roads, the same infrastructure. Absolutely. No new highways has been built. And the uh, provincial government, I spoke uh, with Premier Ford the other day, and they were saying 
it's Safed's, I mean, the, the government, they are they're stalling, they're talking about this uh, environmental issue. So no new hospitals, let alone hospitals, infrastructure, uh, yeah. uh, everything, but uh, universities. We don't even have a stadium for a uh, soccer World Cup. We got yeah. it, but they're saying it's the 40,000 is the minimum capacity. So major infrastructure projects, if you could clear on that one, and also almost a million people are adding up there, whether they're PR, citizenship, or even students, or even visitors, like if, yeah. if, if an international student is here, the parents are here, God forbid anything goes wrong, they'll still use the same one emergency department, one yeah. hospital in Brampton, please. So, um, I know you really love those stadiums, because uh, <laughs> you bring it up often, yeah. so I'll definitely let the infrastructure minister know, but uh, we're not standing in the way of building hospitals. Uh, I know, you know, there's a, a court case going on about the highway, but we're not standing in the way of any hospitals being built. Um, and so the Ontario government is free to build as many hospitals as they would like. I would like them to build four or five in Brampton if they, if they please. I encourage them to do so. And uh, nor are we standing in the way of many of those infrastructure projects that you just uh, referred to. Those are in the provincial realm. Um, we hope that they do build them. Going back to the levels, I, I, I know that... Uh, Sorry, we highway have also, because um, the court just mentioned, you could correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. that you stepped out of your jurisdiction and, and, uh, yeah. and the Ford government is blaming the federal government that yes, they... They just stepped out of the jurisdiction yeah. and we are going to launch a court case. So it was a mixed opinion, uh, okay. meaning like on, on for some, for in some areas, they think the, it does rise to a national concern and the federal government, uh, is it appropriate for them to assess those projects? Okay. And in other cases, it's, it's not uh, appropriate for us to have a, an assessment body to assess those projects. So I welcome the Supreme Court's decision and uh, I hope that you know the Ford government uh, takes that decision and uh, goes on their way and does what they see fit and what the voters have asked them to do, okay. right? So I'm not somebody who will stand in the way of uh, progress that needs uh, to be made. And when it comes to immigration connecting to all of these things, uh, we also have a huge shortage in a lots of our labor. We have constantly uh, construction building and trades industries coming to us and telling us uh, heating and plumbing has just told me that in the next five years, 70,000 of their employees are headed into retirement. We also had early retirements happen during the pandemic. So there's lots of voids to fill. And in the announcement of the levels uh, plan, we've also made it so that provinces can select their own industries and sectors that they need uh, people in. So skilled trades, trucking just got announced here in Ontario. Uh, and it is important to know that in the levels plan, we are trying to absorb the students that are here, right? So if we had a drastic decrease all of a sudden, um, there are people who've been working very hard for four or five years, paying their taxes. I'm not saying any of them are uh, guaranteed PR, but at least an opportunity, right? And if we were to shut the levels numbers down, that means none of them could get PR. Um, and we would have a different problem on our hands at that point. And I'm sure you would be sitting here asking me different questions as to how to help support those people that are giving economic benefit to our country. So we're trying to absorb those people. We're trying to allow people to bring their spouse from, you know, from wherever around the world. About 100,000 of the people in the Levels Plan are family class, meaning their spouse or parents. They come and live with their family member that's already here. Parents come and live with the family member that's already here, right? So yes, there is a percentage that would need new infrastructure for sure. And I, I agree with you. And that's why we're trying to work in all of those areas as well. Yeah, you won't find an argument from me as far as bringing in more immigrants is concerned because I know... But we uh, need to do it responsibly. Responsibly. I, I would say yeah. that we do need to do it responsibly. Yeah. Uh, I'm not trying to just, um, you know, uh, to disagree with you at any point. I think we're on the same page. Right. We need to do it. We need to figure out how to move people around, have them in the right areas, have yeah. them in the right sectors. And that's something we're really trying to focus on and, and do. Right. Last two questions. Uh, uh, quickly, one... With people from both sides of the fences from across the globe, uh, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, whether it's Sinhalese or Tamils, then recently we've seen Israel, Hamas conflict, you know, yeah. and uh, it has so many ramifications across the globe. What are we doing to unify everyone? Uh, I think we should start talking uh, yeah. about integration. There's been a lot of discussion about multiculturalism, but how many people... Uh, let's go to Brampton. You live in Brampton. I live in Brampton. Mm -hmm. If you go to Brampton today or even for that matter, Mississauga, how many people would know when was the, uh, you know, Italian History Month, when was the Black History Month? They don't even know when it was. 
So when we talk about multiculturalism, we see uh, it as giving funding to different organizations. Then they celebrate, which is great. Then there is a photo op, which is great. But then are we really integrating each other? Are we embracing the, each other's cultures? So that is the question. So multiculturalism is great, but how do we integrate? How do we make sure Canada yeah. first? That's the question. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I do think people do find it important to be recognized. Uh, like Italian Heritage Month was in June. Uh, we post about it. I know I have many followers in Brampton that probably see, oh, this is Portuguese Heritage Month. But I, I understand what you're trying to say at many of those events. How, how can we best bring other communities together yeah. uh, to work with each other? And, you know, I think overall in Canada, we do have that. I do think we have integration in lots of areas of Canada. Um, I think sometimes we um, look at some pockets of Canada um, and think that the, the problem is all country nationwide. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think in many places and cities around Canada, um, you know, they don't have a predominant one culture or one population. Uh, in some areas we do, and we're trying to do better. We're trying to, to figure out, you know, how, how that can be done. I've, I'm born and raised here. I have friends from many communities. Uh, sometimes, though, people do still gravitate towards familiarity, right? The familiar food, familiar language, shared ties, customs, bonds. That's hard to stop as well, right? We right. can only encourage people to reach out uh, to their neighbors, and I continue to do that in every message that I give to Canadians. Uh, I think um, our multiculturalism is beautiful. I think we should learn more about each other. Uh, I think embracing each other's differences is what Canada is all about. Um, there have been incidences that lead me to have some concern uh, and worry at times that, you know, are we going to continue to keep that harmony? But I am optimistic that we are going to. Uh, we just need to, to work harder and remind Canadians uh, about what Canadian values are uh, and why we come to this country, why so many people have come to this country. And it's because it gives so many people an opportunity to be themselves, to express themselves, uh, but to live in peace. And, uh, and I think that third point is the most important, uh, to live in peace with each other. And so I think as a government, we'll continue to model um, that leadership. And uh, I think it is important for our leaders in the country to uh, tell everyone to maintain calm um, when there are incidences that, you know, get people heated or do two different sides. Um, the tensions are growing. Uh, leadership matters. And if leaders in the country are playing into that hatred and dividing and trying to excite one side or another, I think that's very dangerous. I think we need to make sure it's my responsibility, it's your responsibility as media to ask for calm, ask for patience, and continue to remind people what Canada is about. Yeah, I couldn't agree more on this one that it's our responsibility, collective responsibility as you as an elected leaders and us and the media that we try and discuss these things, that we need to respect each other. This will be my last question. The recent events that we're witnessing across the globe and even otherwise uh, as well, the India-Canada file as well. The, the, the sticky point that I see sometimes, whether it's India-Canada file or otherwise as well, sometimes the issues that are happening you know, in a different part of the world, as much as we're all tied, maybe from India, someone's from Pakistan, yeah. someone's from Middle East, so they would want to discuss it over here, the protests, so many other things are happening over here, whereas we have our own issues. And let me say this, uh, yes, I agree, protests are an integral part of democracy, but then to what extent, that's my question. Uh, because we're seeing massive issues happening over here. Uh, and I think so I could be wrong. We're not really focusing on more on the Canadian issues. We should be doing that. And my, uh, the second part of the same question is uh, freedom of speech is fine. But then where is our freedom of speech? Mm -hmm. We in the media, we speak up our mind. But do you as elected representatives speak up your mind? We just saw something. I won't say whether it was right or wrong. But mm -hmm. we saw a Home Secretary being shuffled out for speaking her mouth, but at least, mm -hmm. I, I may or may not agree with her, but mm -hmm. at least she spoke up her, her mind. Yeah. That is one thing I'm expecting out of, this is what leadership is all about. Yeah. So where is your and your colleagues' freedom of speech? That's my question. Yeah, um, I think we are modeling that leadership. So the incident you're talking about is at Queen's Park, uh, at the provincial legislature where that happened. 
at the federal level, you'll see that many MPs have uh, uh, spoken out in statements and letters and on their social media. Uh, and as the Liberal Party always has been, uh, we are a, a big tent party that has people from all sides of different opinions, different views, um, and they are expressing those views and they're sharing them with the Prime Minister, some privately, some publicly, but everyone is sharing their opinions. And I, I think that is important and I think the Prime Minister also uh, could have been uh, extremely strict or wanting to discipline their M his MPs uh, for speaking their mind, but he, he didn't do that. He said, you know, this is an issue. Uh, that Canadians need to see that, you know, we all have the freedom and even MPs have the freedom to speak their mind and and if we have different views, it's only reflective of our population, right? And Parliament should reflect uh, the population and the difference of views we have in our population. Um, as for issues uh, that hit home with diaspora communities that are happening around the world, it's not only a challenge for Canada, it's a challenge for a lot of Western countries that have embraced immigration from around the world. Uh, it's only natural, it's always been that way. Um, whether it's from Irish settlers or you know any period in time when there are issues happening uh, across the world in their home countries those issues have come into Canadian shores and now uh, those that have been here for many many generations will sometimes you know find it shocking that people are uh, so so attached uh, but it's it's natural I think it's natural um, to to care and there is a part of governing uh, and being Canadian that also does connect with the international community, right? We are a global, uh, connected world now. And so there are going to always be feelings, I think. We can't stop them in Canada, nor can the US, nor can the UK, n none of these countries. And so we have to figure out how, um, how to work and how to embrace all of the differences that we have. Yeah, yeah my point was, um, I'll explain a little bit more, you know, uh, when there was farmers protest and I was interviewed on CBC and they asked, as much as they invited me to, we were talking about this before the show, you know, they asked me, we'll talk about farmers' protest. And suddenly out of the blue, she questioned me, uh, what's the Khalistan issue between India and Canada? Mm -hmm. And do you think Canadian government supports Khalistan? I said, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Because then I reminded them that actually it was your reporter um, you know, who asked in Mumbai, and the Canadian Prime Minister said it very openly, we stand for United Canada, yeah. India. So, but when i when i interview anybody from india and when i see their channels they're trying to project as if trudeau has some sort of hatred for india you yeah. guys support khalistan and uh, many times those allegations are even made for member par parliaments from the indian origin as well as yeah. if as if there's some some people grouping together here and supporting yeah. khalistan as much as i'm concerned i said it on cbc i said absolutely not i don't think so navdi bans uh, that was navdi bans was yeah. active and i said any of his colleagues they would support Khalistan. That, that's not at all true. But if CBC has, is asking me, maybe they weren't clear on this one, and in Indian media and Indian many elected officials, they clearly allege yeah. that no, you, you maybe you don't know, but, uh, and, and they don't speak out openly. They, they somehow support the idea of Khalistan. They support it. That's what they say. Yeah. Well, it's hard for me to comment on Indian journalism. Um, but what I am seeing, and it's not, uh, it's hard to miss because, you know, you click on one link and, and you're fed all of this information day after day. It's upsetting. It is really upsetting to see that uh, they are smearing the image of, uh, I'll say, sick Canadians and, and painting them all with the same brush that if you happen to be uh, of a particular, uh, your family background, then you must support you know, um, Khalistan, or you must support this, or everyone is, you know, thinking this way. I think it's a way to um, discredit uh, a government. It's a way to discredit individuals, their opinions, um, and it's a tactic. And so it's not, it's, I, I wish that, you know, hopefully people see through that tactic. And uh, because those that have met us uh, know that uh, in Canada, we, we love traveling to India. We love going to India. Um, we have no ill will uh, against uh, you know, the Indian community. Uh, and we want to see that country thrive and prosper, especially uh, someone like me who is, you know, whose parents uh, come from that country. 
And so uh, in that also sometimes comes um, criticism or uh, from time to time. You know, there was a lot of criticism Canadians had for uh, President Trump uh, across the, just the border here. But that didn't mean Canadians were anti-American. Right. Uh, so just like there may be, you know, uh, issues that from time to time happen between governments, uh, that is normal. It doesn't mean that you are anti uh, that country. Right. Uh, disputes do happen. And I think we should be able to figure out how to separate emotions, um, emotions from that. And uh, I think those two things are being mixed together and they, they need to be separated because it's very dangerous. All right, I wish we had more time uh, and I thank you for your time at this point. And I must appreciate without blurring the lines that yes, uh, uh, you, take, you took our time and answered all, all the questions today. And anything else you want to say to anyone here to our viewers, please feel free to do so. I know the poll numbers are not very encouraging for you at, the, at this moment. You know, I was looking at the numbers I saw, oh gosh, I got to go to 1993 even before I started my journalism career to see if at all the yeah. poll numbers come out true. But uh, please feel free to say anything to our audience, please. Yeah, I, I would just like to say uh, that as a member of parliament for Brampton North, it's uh, uh, been an immense pleasure serving uh, for these years. And I want to continue to remind uh, residents of Brampton North, but all Canadians, that you can reach out to your member of parliament, uh, give us your feedback, uh, give us some solutions as to what you think uh, we should be doing to address certain problems. But um, mostly, uh, I want people to reflect and to uh, think about what it means to be Canadian. And uh, just like we were discussing today, uh, that it's on all of us, it's our civic duty and responsibility to make sure that we are good Canadians, contributing to society and contributing to the harmony of this country. Thank you so much, Ubiji, and we wish you all the best. Thank, Thank you. you. You take care. That's all uh, at uh, Channel Y Studios. Hope uh, you enjoyed today's discussion. Please stay tuned with Y Media. Thank you. Hi, this is Priyanka Chopra, and you are watching Channel Y. The biggest South Asian media group, Y Media. Y Media. Y Media. Y Media Group, established in 2001, is a media company with a 360 degree approach in reaching our audience over five platforms television radio, newspaper, online news portal, and mobile app. Y Media has newspaper, midweek, radio, South Asian Pulse. Hi, I'm Amitabh Bachchan and you're listening to South Asian Pulse. Hi, this is Amir Khan and you're listening to South Asian Pulse. All English, 24-7 television network and Y Media Plus. Watching Channel Y. Channel Y. Prime Minister, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be back. is the official media partner for TIFF 2022. It's so exciting to be here. And this is an exclusive show all about the Toronto International Auto Show. So Cam's gonna tell us more about uh, the amazing vehicle behind us right now. The Devel 16. Hi, I'm Ria Khan, and on behalf of Y Media, welcome to Channel Y. One Y Media Group welcomes you to Channel Y once again. Channel Y ke entertainment special sure. made jahan SouthAsianDaily.com, the biggest South Asian media group. Why media? Why?